We hope you enjoy the following Playboy Radio production. Chances are you're going to love what you hear. Please go to playboyradio.com and become a member for more playmates, more shows, and exclusive extras. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. And we're here at Playboy Sports. I'm your host, Greg Miller. I'm here with the legendary record producer and bass player, Don Waz. Welcome to Playboy Sports. Good to see you, Greg. Thank you, man. Thanks, Don. So, Don, you know, you're one of the great record producers of our time with rock and roll, rock music, which is something that is sort of a dying breed in, in today's world, today's society. How do you keep the edge for yourself on keeping up with, you know, extreme rock and roll music that needs to be heard from legendary artists? Well, you know, it ain't easy, man. You know? <laughs> these, these aren't really, like, great times for rock and roll. Uh, I, I just produced a, a band called Vintage Trouble. And uh, they're, like, a killer rock and roll band. Uh, they're... They're on tour. They're opening all over the world for ACDC. So that means they get up in front of 100,000 people every night. 100,000 people who haven't heard their songs, don't, you know, never heard of these guys, right. and are there to see ACDC and would like this concert, that portion of the concert, to start. And night after night after night, uh, this band has people dancing and screaming and singing along at the end, which is unheard of for an opening band yeah. at a, in a stadium show. And uh, and we're having a rough time selling records on them. Right. It's there's no there are no radio stations to really play what they do. And it's a weird time like that. You you know. But you know, it's great. It's great though how you have put it out. There. And I've seen that you 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 look for new artists, right? You're you're searching for those next great rock artists, aren't you? Yeah, someone's got to. You know, I mean, uh, you just want. Ultimately, you want to make great records. Yeah. Here's the thing. Music means a whole lot to people. We kind of know that, you know, but really what it does is, uh, you know, on a neurological level, it it opens certain synapses and it, it helps you, it helps you make sense out of a life that's very confusing. I mean, none of us, we, we don't know why we're here. Right, right. <laughs> you know? and, and music, really good music can help you deal with that right you know with the mysteries of life and uh, uh, so I, I, I think it's an essential thing for people and I just try to make really good records you know and part of the problem with music today if if you see things like the VMAs that was just happening you know and I just want to put it out there I want to go on record and I just want to say <laughs> Kanye West sucks okay <laughs> and it's guys like that that are hurting music for the future and the energy that's being spread there is not one that's conducive with like a positive energy i mean the guy's like a narcissist and he's up there ranting and raving about award shows let's get to the music i mean the guy does isn't even talented does things like that bother you when you see events like that go on where they're not focused on music i never thought it was you know i'll tell you something man i was in the my band was not was. We were the house band for the MTV Video Music Awards, <laughs> like back in the like late '80s, I think. And uh, I didn't think it had much to do about music even then. Right. <laughs> it was mostly okay. a lot of people standing up there, dancing and lip syncing to pre-recorded music, and uh, uh, you know, I, there's room for everything. <laughs> I hear you. No, I know. Listen, you're being diplomatic. It just bothers me when I see things like that happening. And, you know, where's the focus of music? The, there's an, a cliche going on where people say rock and roll is dead. But, you know, someone like you, you're doing everything you can to keep it going, keep it alive. Well, you know, man, all you got to do is go to a Stones concert. Right. Go to a, an ACDC concert. Mm -hmm. uh, go to, <laughs> you know, I mean... There are all kinds of bands out there. Right. You can go to a Black Keys concert, man. There's plenty of rock and roll out right. there. Right. But uh, you got to see it live. You know, we're not producing as much great live music. Now, talk about live music. You've worked with some of the greatest bands of all time. You've worked with the Rolling Stones on several occasions. Tell us about some of your experiences. What was the greatest experience ever working with the Rolling Stones? Oh, man, there's so many. You know, uh, every day was like mind-blowing and I, I've spent years of my life with those guys but uh, there wasn't a day that I ever took for granted over something that uh, that was mind-blowing 
didn't happen. I mean, getting to play with them was pretty cool. Wow. Which I've done a few times. You know, I played on stage with them. It's just, I think they're, they're issuing it now. Uh, we did an album called Stripped, uh, which was like an unplugged album, maybe 1994. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and one of the songs we did was uh, Shine a Light. And that on the original record, Billy Preston played organ. And, yeah. And I think Nicky Hopkins played piano on it. So they didn't have, just, they just had Chuck LaBelle. And he mm-hmm. couldn't play both parts, so I played the organ part, and I went on stage with him at, uh, at the Olympia in Paris, and I'm trying to think where else in Paradiso in Amsterdam. We we cut it in a few places to get to the final thing, and that was a trip, man, to play Billy Preston's parts with the Rolling right? Stones on stage. Uh, That's awesome. That what is? <laughs> and and then also, I mean, you've worked obviously with. Um, you know Paul McCartney, and you just recently did something with Ringo Starr. Didn't you win a Grammy last year for your efforts? Yeah, I, I won an Emmy. Oh, an Emmy. I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. I won you won Emmy. Grammys. I won, you I won, won your first Emmy yeah, for the TV production the, of working that, that Beatles uh, CBS tribute. To oh, the right. Beatles, that not, was not amazing. That was a that was really a trip, man. Yeah. So you worked with the Beatles, and you just won an Emmy, right? Working at the. Uh, what was that about, working on TV? Well, it was a CBS, it was a, uh, a tribute to the, honoring the, the 50th anniversary of their first appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. It's called The Night That Changed America. It's a bunch of artists doing Beatles songs. Yeah. And then Ringo and Paul came out and played. And then they played together, which was really a trip. They, you know, they did Hey Jude, and Ringo said it was the first time he played it since they recorded it. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> he, he, he never played it live anywhere, and he, did, he didn't sing it, so he doesn't do it in his show. And it was amazing to see you on stage. I remember watching it on TV and seeing you up there. I was really excited for you. Well, it was a real trip, man, to play those songs in front of them. I, I, I put a band together, and I played bass in it, and I knew McCartney was going to be sitting right in front of me, and he was... I wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for him. Man, I, I saw really? him when I was 12. I thought, that's what I want to do. And so I wanted to... I wanted to, I, I didn't want to be cavalier about it, so I really studied those parts. I actually got the Beatle multi-tracks, and, and A, I soloed his bass part, and there's a lot of stuff that you don't hear that he's doing, but that's, that becomes part of the thing, so I, I learned the nuances. And then, uh, also, and then I watched like his current band on YouTube to see like which parts stood the test of time. What's something that just happened that right. one night when they recorded it and was not one of the major things and, and what's something that, that mm-hmm. carries through. And and you get to the essence of the part. And I really rehearsed it, man. I, I had, like I said, I had the multi-track. So once mm-hmm. I learned his part, I took his part out and I mixed the Beatles without the bass and I sat there in my bedroom like I did when I was 12 and I played along with the Beatles. Oh and, and I tried to get the parts down. And... Uh, I was just amazed, man. He's so he's so great, man. His ba- like the bass part to something, the song something. It's like Mozart, you know, man. It, it just it works. Yeah. It's it's he's playing the bass notes, but he's playing like the lead part too, right. and he's doing percussive stuff. It, it's it's kind of the same thing. James Jamerson did that in an R and B way in uh, on the Motown records, mm-hmm. you know. But very few guys, man, cover all those three bass players. It, really take to get everything Paul did. Well, you know, you're talking to a fellow musician here, yeah. so I get the vibe, man. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That That is some, some exciting stuff. Now, you know, you've worked with some of the greatest songwriters of all time, like Bob Dylan. I know you and Bob are close. Mm-hmm. I read something. What was it, a, a quote that you had said about what Bob wrote about when it came to songwriting, how it happens for him. You know, that's always the magic oh, yeah. for a songwriter, how it happens. Somebody says to you, how did you write the song? How did you come up with it? What was that thing that Bob said? Well, I asked him, uh, I said, how come you can write Gates of Eden and I can't? <laughs> this <laughs> okay. is really the, the billion dollar question. Right. And he said something to the effect of, he said, well, uh, he said, look, I didn't really write that. I remember moving my hand, right? Uh, you know, holding the pencil over the paper. Right. I don't know where it came through me. And you find that a lot of guys, you know, the greatest writers I know, uh, Chris Christopherson, Billy Nelson. Right. I, I worked with both those guys, Keith Richards and Nick. They'll, they'll tell you the same thing, man. It came comes from beyond and it travels through. You know, on the sessions, Keith Richards, he never says, wait, 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 I got an idea. He always says, hold it, hold it, incoming. 
Okay. It's a message coming through. And, uh, I like that. I always love that, you know, but the, the real guys know, you know, it, it's, it's a mystery. Yeah, I agree with that. I really related to that when I saw that because I often wonder sometimes for myself when I've written songs, you don't know where it comes from. It just drives through you, but it's hard to explain that to other people. Yeah. Now, you've also worked with, and let's get to the point here, of one of my favorite bands of all time and some of my favorite musicians that come from the Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was Jerry Garcia who passed away back in 95. Did you ever get a chance to work with Jerry? No, I never met him. No? No. No, no I would have liked to yeah, I know Dylan had done a bunch of things with him. Bob Dylan loved him, yeah. But Bob considered him to be a very soulful, musical guy, yeah. But didn't you ever get a chance to work with Bob Weir? Well, I, I guess we can talk about it now. I couldn't talk about it for a while, but, um, yeah, I got to know Bobby and, and, and Mickey and Billy, and they, they wanted to keep going after the, those July concerts, yeah. the Fairly Well shows, but Phil didn't want to keep playing with them. And... Uh, so they were looking, they called me, they were looking for ways to keep going. And to be honest with you, I, I was kind of hoping I, uh, maybe I'd take Phil's spot. But Did they ask you? Well, I went up there, I did play with them. Wow. And and, uh, and, and I played along with their records for years. But Phil's in the records. Phil, yeah. <laughs> so you take Phil's him out. pretty good at bass, too. He, Phil Lash is, <laughs> is wild, man. He's yeah. a great bass player. And... What he does is crazy, man. Like, no one approaches the bass like that. It's really quite brilliant. And I, uh, you know, I couldn't do it. I, I mean, my, my brain doesn't work like his. It's, when I played bass, it sounded like a bad Grateful Dead cover oh. band. But what I did do was I brought John Mayer with me, who is a buddy of mine. And, and uh, you know, I've worked on, I've produced his last two records. And I knew uh, what a huge dead fan he was right and, and out of that came this dead and company tour so so the five of us played together some, some of the time and mike gordon from fish played bass uh, a couple of the days that i was up there and uh O'Teal was gonna oh man there. let me be the fly on the wall for that jam session yeah it was it was pretty cool it was it was, it was really it was very low-key but we and we did the those songs too, you know, just to play those songs with those guys. But I was acutely aware that, uh, Ma, I just hear the beat in a different place. I, I think Phil, he's a very linear thinker, almost like a guitar player, really. And what I did notice, especially like listening to, uh, I, I subscribed and watched all those Fairly Well concerts, all five of them. And well, I got, a, I've never met him, so I, I don't really know, but I got a sense that he doesn't play a song the whole night is a one song and yeah. there's continuity between what he does from and it builds and there's a dynamic involved so he plays these things really differently every night and you can't take any one song out mm -hmm. of context it's part of the flow of the night yeah and so it, true it's like a jazz musician really you know it, it's like uh, it's like Coltrane man would do that you know that's unbelievable yeah great story you know certainly for me my all-time favorite band I mean I've gone on to love so many different genres of music but it's the one kind of music and sound that I could always just roll back to yeah. and I you know I was at a couple of those shows up in San Francisco and we'll look forward to the Dead and Company when they come here and they tour through LA and that's so exciting that you were introducing John Mayer to them yes. who's really going to do a phenomenal job on the lead guitars I think he's going to blow people's minds. Yeah. You know? And he's coming from a good place, man. Really humble approach. He's not trying to replace Jerry Garcia. Right. He just, he, you know, if you're a fan of that music, you just want to hear it played live. You know, it just makes you feel good to hear it and to be at those concerts. And he's just trying to, I mean, it's a very generous approach he's taking. He just wants to do it and, and let people experience that music. Yeah. Someone's got to do it, you know. Well, it's exciting. Maybe we'll catch one of those shows when they come around New Year's Eve. <laughs> I, I wouldn't miss it. Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, maybe we'll do it. And, you know, lastly, I know that you've got some great projects still ahead of you. Obviously, you're doing an incredible job handling the Blue Note. Well, I'm real proud of what we're doing at, at Blue Note. Uh, it's the world's greatest jazz label, and we got a, a really vibrant, robust roster of young musicians. They're not all young. Charles Lloyd and Wayne Shorter are the, the, the legends of... Of the, of the field and they're both on Blue Note making great records stuff.